Welcome, everybody, to the Yo Kid Sports Podcast. I'm your host, Anthony Gargano. This is the podcast that surrounds everything youth sports. So I've covered pro and college sports the highest level, and I have fallen in love with youth sports. I'm a big believer in sports for children. I, I just think it's a it's such a great a, uh, great outlet and keeps them out of trouble. Keeps them they learn so many great life lessons. So as we go forward with the podcast, we're going to be talking to a lot of different people in the world of youth sports. We'll talk to some professional athletes who have children of themselves. We'll talk about the journey of the athlete. We'll highlight some of the terrific youth uh, sports athletes across the Delaware Valley and beyond. Uh, But really, we really wanted to try to give some advice to the parents. Listen, if you got a good story, good idea, please, like I said, hit me up and we'll get to Yo Kids Sports Podcast. Welcome to another edition of the Yo Kid Sports Podcast. And don't forget, we do this for kids, for the parents, as we navigate the complicated world of youth sports. Please subscribe. Hit the little button. It's free. Subscribe to it. We give you all kinds of experts, including my guest today, who I love. And we want to thank him because he's busy right now scouting uh, Texas and Houston He's a scout for the Phillies, a former big league pitcher for the Diamondbacks, and he's a dad. Coach, he does it all. Michael Koplov joins us. Mikey. How's it going? How's how's Texas? It's good. It's not nearly as hot as I'm used to to being down in Texas. It was actually a little chilly. They opened the roof last night. I was like, what's happening here? So, but it's good. I'm ready to go home, though. Ready to watch the Phillies at home. (laughs) Ready for the little World Series action. Exactly. Exactly. It'll be, it'll be fantastic. So one of the things that, you know, you are perfect for this because, you know, you were a youth star, you played in the bigs, you, you did everything and you're a dad and you're yeah. a coach. And so you understand from the youth level. So let's start with first balancing, you know, your, your own career and then being dad to Alex, your son. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's for me, it's tricky because the the time of year that I'm really busy um, with my work for the Phillies, you know, scouting and running around the whole country is baseball season. So uh, the spring, uh, a lot of the summer and then uh, obviously some of the fall, too. And it's, you know, so it's hard for me. I miss a lot of the actual games that he plays. Um, So like I haven't perfected that that balance part of it yet. I, I miss more than I would like. Uh, from an actual game perspective but uh, when I'm home I'm home with him I get to everything that I you know everything that he has I coach him you know off the field in terms of um, you know just his actual his baseball training or whatever I do with him and I'm with him all the time with that me and my dad and my brother so um, you know I'm there as much as as I can possibly be there, but it's also, there is that, that tough balance of, because there's, there's a lot going on in my life from a work perspective that keeps me away from it. That makes it a little bit harder to, to be as, as involved as I would like to be. So I have to kind of pass it off to family members. And don't forget our Yo Kids sports podcast is presented by Primo Hoagies. Listen, Know what I've always said for years and years and years. It's not just a hoagie. It's a primo. And uh, this fall, whether you're tailgating, football, soccer, it's youth, you name it, make sure you got your primo hoagie party tray. Nothing like it for the big game. And speaking of football and the big game, this fall we're giving away a trip to Vegas to see the very big game to one very lucky, very deserving coach. So if you know a youth coach that you think deserves recognition for their outstanding dedication and passion, make your nominations today, primohogies.com. You can go directly mvc.primohogies.com. Our most valuable coach promotion here at Primo's. I love it. We, We gotta shine some love, give some love to these youth coaches that spend their time, many of whom uh, just getting an earful and <laughs> no compensation. So they're the best. Nominate your favorite coach. Again, it's the uh, Primo Hoagies Most Valuable Coach Contest. I love it. I think it's great. 
And who knows, maybe they'll get to see uh, the birds at the big game. Wouldn't that be something? We'll get into the family members a little bit. <laughs> uh, I, it's curious. Like, so Alex is, has he turned 11 yet? Uh, uh, in a month. Yeah, he's yeah, in a month. November. He'll turn 11. Yeah. 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 So, ha, ha, like, which, when you look at him, he's, he's my yeah. son and he's a baby. And we, we, you know, our kids, full disclosure, played together. And, I, you know, I love your, I love your Alex. He's just a great kid. And what, 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 when you kind of navigate for them, what are you kind of looking for? Like, what's your goal? Like, we all have goals for our children without throwing, hey, I want you to be me and go pitch right. in the big leagues. Right, right, right. See, it's, it's, I mean, there's like the dream goal, which is that, which is like, you know, that's not really a goal. Not yet. He's 11. Um, you know, when he first started playing, I, I, I always said, like, if he can – do all of this, it, assuming he likes it and wants to keep playing, which he does. Um, and it can get him to a, a good college and help him with that point. Like that's, that's all I want. I have, everything else on top of that is kind of gravy for me. Um, but I'm, I'm, you know, I'm doing this with the idea that it'll help him get into a good college. He loves playing baseball. Um, it's fun for him. Uh, you know, he gets to play with a lot of kids, all of his friends, all of these kinds of things. It's a good experience or hopefully a good experience uh, for him. And and that's the goal. Now, if it turns out, you know, where I'm going to do everything I can to make him as good of a player as he can possibly be, as he wants to be. And if it becomes he's not good enough for college, that's fine. If it becomes he's good enough to go beyond college, that's that's great also. Um, but like, I don't I, I haven't put too high of expectations on him um, beyond just get him as good as he can be and let the cards kind of fall where they may. You know, he works really hard. He's practicing five, six days a week, um, even when I'm not there. And for the most part, he enjoys it. There are days where he comes home from school and he's tired and cranky as we all know kids can be. And those days are a little more of a grind for everybody, but there are a lot of days where he's just like, what time, Am I going? What time's grandpa picking me up or what time are you taking me? And he goes there and he, and he, and he does his stuff and he's, you know, he's getting better. He's it's, it's a process, but he's getting better. What's the training methods that, you know, cause a lot of parents will say, Hey, like, you know, what should I do? What should I be doing with my child? Yeah. Well, I mean, there's, there's a lot to it with baseball. I think at this age, one of the most important things, and and I have to really start focusing on this with, with Alex, more than uh, more than I have is just just general athleticism training, you know, speed, quickness, agility, you know, you know, explosive strength, all that kind of stuff, because not necessarily certainly not weight room stuff or anything like that, but just like jumping and plyometrics and all and, and sprinting and all this kind of stuff like that stuff can get better. And there's this window here before, you know, kind of before they start to develop really physically, that um, is a really good time to do that. And so that's that's a key to it because no matter how much skill training you do like there's sort of a, a ceiling athletically that you got to just kind of keep pushing up um so that the skill training can come up with it because you you know you could be as skilled as, as you can but if 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 you're not there athletically to, to match it then there's going to be you know you're going to hit a wall at some point um so that's a big part of it um and then baseball is you know, it's a highly skilled sport. Like there's a lot of, um, you know, there's a lot of like detail that, that you have to do that needs to be, it can only be perfected through repetition over and over and over. There's a reason people hit however many, you know, it takes so much batting practice from the time they're a little kid and, or, or, you know, pitching, throwing so many pitches and learning how to do different things on the mound or, or fielding ground balls and, and fielding them the right way and all of that kind of stuff. Like it, it takes repetition. It takes time. It, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a detailed sport with a lot of, you know, a lot of aspects to it that need to be worked on over and over because it's, it's, it's hard. Yeah. And the, the each position is its own challenge, right? Like, yeah. you know, like you talk about, all right, so if Alice is playing short, all right, how we're going to feel the, you know, the, there is a, cor like you talk about the correct way of circling to the ball and being able to make all the throw, you know, make your throws and feel it correctly and go to second when you have to go to yeah. second for a force or a double player, go to first and knowing everything. So you have that, but then you have 
you know, is he going to pitch? Is he right. going to play catcher? Is he going to play the outfield? Is he going to play first? Like every, it's amazing. It's yeah. the beauty of the sport, which is each position. Do you believe in multiple positions and teaching multiple, you know? Yes. Yes. I mean, yes, somewhat. Um, so we, you know, we move guys around the field a, a decent amount. Alex knows how to play short, knows how to play second. He's learning a little bit of third um, just so that, you know, if he's got to go over there, he can, he, he can, he can do it. Um, hasn't done much in the outfield, although, you know, running and catching fly balls, he he's generally able to do. Um, but yeah, I think to a point, like kids need to, need to be moving around and moving around and moving around um, and learning the game from that standpoint, because you never know where you're going to end up. Like if, if you're a shortstop at nine, it doesn't mean you're a shortstop even by the time you're 12, because there are other kids that are, that are, you know, also very good. Um, and certainly even if you're a shortstop at 12, it doesn't mean you're going to be the varsity shortstop on your high school team. Um, so you need to learn the game from all of those standpoints and, and have some idea, um, so yeah, I, I, I think there's value in making sure everyone on the field knows what their, um, what their responsibilities are and what their teammates responsibilities are. Um, but also like they're starting to get to an age now where it's becoming a little more competitive and, um, you start to see teams where on the Sundays of tournaments, at least like guys are in their position and they're not really moving. Um, and that's kind of the way travel ball is. And if you want to be competitive, like you have to sort of match that. Um, otherwise, you're putting yourself at a competitive disadvantage that makes it hard. So there's like that balance there between making sure kids are are getting some experience and also helping them learn how to win because it's no fun. And been on both sides of it where you go to the ballpark and you lose 12-1 and, you know, that's not productive for doesn't help the kids like sports either or you know or like what they're doing when they're getting their butts kicked yeah it's funny um they they did well Moss's team did well this past weekend so coincidentally he was like hey dad can i throw to you um and i was like yeah like you know like that's music yeah but like, you know when they ask you when they ask do it yeah you know and i'm not saying dude you got to come out we got to go you know yeah. let's go and yeah. it's, it's kind of interesting Let's talk about pitching because you were a big league pitcher. You threw really hard. Your brother threw really hard. I mean, you you know you that's you made your bones pitching. What what's the what's the appropriate kind of grooming of a young pitcher? I mean, especially you know, like they haven't even gone through puberty yet. Yeah, yeah. It's 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 weird to me. I don't I don't know if I know the answer to that because I look back at what I did, and from the time I was eight or nine, like. I have game balls from when I was eight playing at the Sabre League in South Philly. And it's like, I threw a no hitter, six innings, 18 strikeouts and all this kind of stuff. And I'm like, I must've thrown a lot of pitches to do that. Right. And I'm like, if a kid gets to 50 pitches now and I'm in the dugout, I'm like panicking. I'm like, I got to get him out. He's had so many pitches, so many pitches. Right. That didn't like, that wasn't the case when we were growing up, like kids just pitched. Like if you were getting them out, you pitched a complete game and you'd pitch a complete game twice a week. Um, and you know, my elbow was sore sometimes and I had to take a step back and not play, not pitch for a month. And my dad would, his hair would get grayer, uh, as a result of it. And it like, that's frustrating. And you have to kind of figure that out. I think at this, in this day and age, I'm more comfortable erring on the side of caution with the kids. And if you have to pull them out early to, you know, th then so be it. But I don't know. I just don't know like the the right answer because like I said, like I used to throw all the time. And and even when I didn't pitch in games, like I would go in my backyard and I I draw a square on the wall and I would throw a complete game against invisible batters, um, trying to figure out like learn how to pitch. And those were pitches that my arm was throwing and my arm was fine. Um, so like I, I don't know. I think to some extent we're a little overcautious, but it's hard to fault people when you see young kids and so many college and high school kids getting Tommy John surgery. Um, it's like, it's crazy. And I, you know, I don't think anyone knows the right answer. It's just, you got to kind of, each kid is a little different and you have to listen to them when they tell you they're sore or they're tired. Um, as a parent, you have to be willing to tell the coach, Hey, my son can't pitch today. You know, he threw a lot or whatever it is, or he's got one inning or he's fine and let him go. 
um, I think it's it's kind of on everyone to to know their own kid a little bit. Yeah, I, and you know, even when you look at big picture, I, I'm with you. Like I, I don't. Know. I mean, it's <laughs> obvious where <clears throat> you, you know it, you don't need to be. You don't need to have kids beat Nolan Ryan throwing 170 pitches. But there, there. Sometimes I think we don't throw enough. Yeah, and, and I do think, and you see it when you scout, you know, high school and college kids, and and minorly when you do when you look at the minors. I mean, give me some kids that. You know, you, it, it's good for them to build up, yes. you know, analysis a little bit yeah. because, you know, yeah. and, and you see it, you know, again, there's effectiveness that I think when you don't throw enough, you're also at more vulnerable for injury. Yes, I agree. Like, it, you, you can't do it until you've done it. So, uh, you know, all, a lot of minor league prospects, and I'm certain they have data to support it, but like they'll cap them at 100 innings or, or whatever it is. And, um, you know, and just kind of build up from there. And then when they get to the major leagues, like you can't expect them. Like you look at what the Marlins did with Yuri Perez, like they had a, you know, they had to set him down in the minor leagues at one point to kind of control his innings. And um, I'm, I'm not saying it's right or wrong. It's just like, that's the, yeah. the way it's done in the industry now in, in the professional industry. And it certainly wasn't when, when I, you know, and I came up 25 years ago now, um, but guys would just throw like you you're the starting pitcher on the a ball team and you throw every fifth day for the entire a ball season and by the end of the year you have 140 innings or whatever you have and that's that and then next year you do it again um i don't know that injuries are any less now um i do know guys are throwing a lot harder now so it's probably a lot more taxing on their arm to throw that many innings and that many pitches i think it's probably good to monitor that but at the same time like you can't expect them then to be able to do that until they've done it like and you and and it takes time and building up um to, to get there when you're looking at a young pitcher do you limit the amount of the uh you know curveballs and sliders so you any of your breaking stuff like what age do you say it's okay to start throwing breaking stuff you know and kind of like you're know, looking at you know arm strength i know you guys do a lot um, with the Magpies, you do a lot of, uh, you know, how with velo to try to build up, build up the whole trade. Yeah, we, so we're, we're so from a velo standpoint, we're kind of um, last year, last winter, we kind of scaled that back a little bit. We're kind of getting a more defined throwing program now. I think going into this off season with a lot, you know, long toss and you know maybe like one velo day a week. Um, I think they're you know as long as that's that's monitored that's been proven that it's fine at this age um especially like long toss is really good just kids you have to throw hard to throw hard you can't expect that you're going to throw harder if you're not practicing it um like anything else and um the curveballs that's you know there's kind of varying um um reports on that that we started lightly throwing curveballs at like 10 i think i started when i was young the first I, I would always mess around with it. But the first year I ever like got a real curveball, I was 11 years old and um, I started throwing it and throwing it a decent amount. Never really had any problems. I think if, if they're taught to throw it right and, um, and they are throwing it right, it, it, it seems to, you know, the, the uh, studies seem to show there isn't significantly more danger to doing that than just throwing fastballs. Um, the key is throwing it right and learning how and not just twisting your wrist, but kind of throwing it almost like a, like a ham, like you're hammering something in, um, you know, there's a difference there and that's what will make the difference in terms of whether it's going to cause any wear and tear on their, their elbow. Um, but I don't think 11 is too young. I just think you have to, you know, monitor how much it's done and how it's done and they need to start to learn how to do that. You see it, you go to tournaments, kids are doing it um kids are throwing breaking balls and uh and and whatever and i think it's fine i just you have to make sure it's being done right otherwise you're you're running the risk of running into some trouble is there what what kind of drills work when kids need to work you know it could be by themselves it could be <laughs> with parents or coaches what for, do you suggest? from a like, curveball standpoint pitchers. yeah well and pitchers just pitching i know you know, we'll have the towel. I have you yeah. know, snap the towel. If yeah, so if you're, I mean, if you're at home and alone, like that's really, 
one of the main one of the best things you can do like i i like towel drills uh, you put a chair out in front and you you kind of whack that chair and push it out just far enough that you're making sure they they're really reaching out and getting extended and all that and they're not just cutting themselves off but get it out there and and, and um you know that's that's one like by yourself thing if you could if you have space in the yard and and a wall or a net to throw into or one of those little you know home plate looking catchers back there like go back there with a bucket of balls even if they're tennis balls um and really work on it um you know strike throwing just pick a pick a number in that target or a spot in that target and and pound it and pound it and pound it and real every single pitch um focus on that and concentrate on that because the 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 ability to throw strikes starting at this level you see it like if you can't throw strikes it changes the whole game it doesn't matter what team you're playing for or against it changes the whole game and you don't even need to be throwing hard if you throw it over the plate and you have a competent team behind you you're going to have success um so i think i think going out in your yard and just practicing throwing to a target um, any kind of target, get a cone and put a ball on top of it and try to knock the, the ball off the cone, little targets. Um, not just like, I'm going to throw it at that wall, but like something precise and work on that. And, and, and it'll get better the more that they do it. Yeah. And what, the one thing that I, I know that you and your dad and your brother, I mean, the training is so important. Like your training is really, really strong because you know, you believe in all these fundamentals and all this work that takes place outside of the diamond. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, I mean, it has to be done. Like it, it's, you're not just going to kids when they're this young, you know, you'll have some kids that are just bigger and stronger than everyone else and they're going to have success, but eventually that's going to even out. And if those kids aren't, um, you know, putting in the same amount of work or, you know, the other kids are are just physically catching up to them, then that playing field is going to get even evened out. And and the ones that are ultimately, you know, doing the work are, are the ones that are going to get kind of get going past everybody else. So it's, you know, it's, it's frustrating sometimes if you have a kid that isn't where you want them to be at age nine or 10 or 11, but it doesn't necessarily mean that's going to be the case when they're 13 or 14. And if they're willing to and wanting to, practice and you know practice the right way um they can make a lot of gains uh you know puberty does a lot of crazy things to a lot of kids both both ways so um you know they can they can they can kind of catch up and it's it's hard to not get discouraged sometimes but um you know if, if you got to trust that if you find the trainer or or coach that you like and you believe in and that, and they're doing the things the right way it it'll your kid will get as good as they're going to get I heard a story is a, a friend of mine whose son goes to um, your your guys' academy and uh, Vince Panvini. And okay. his son, Vinny's son, was a junior at Eustis. He had been working with you guys for a while. And then from his junior year to his senior year, he had an amazing, and what a great senior year he had, winds up going to, he gets a, a great Division II scholarship really good baseball down South. And it shows you like <laughs> the development that comes, that can come, you know, <laughs> in high school, right? Like, yep. so, you know, parents are nuts. Like yep. we're all crazy. Right. We're all worried about nine, 10, 11, when, you know, development can happen in the high school. Absolutely. I mean, you see kids that go into high school at five foot five, 125 pounds and by junior year they're you know six one 180 and it's a whole different ball game like it, it's it it's different for everyone um for for every kid um and you know some kids don't develop as much as you know you want them to physically and and that's going to be a barrier but um but i think yeah it, there's there's something to be said for just being patient and kind of staying the course because like you said, the parents were, we are nuts and we want everything like right now. Why is my kid not as good as he should be? Why is my kid still batting seventh or ninth? Be, you know, we put in all this work and he's not getting better and I don't see it. I mean, yeah, there's plenty of kids that it's just, that's not going to happen for it's, it's a hard game and you know, it, it just, it, it just is, but, um, but for, for some, they're going to take a leap and, and, if, and it's mostly going to be the ones that are, you know, kind of putting in the, the right amount of work and doing the right, right things. What do you like about 
youth baseball today that's different maybe from when you were growing up or we were growing up and what would you like to see change um i mean i like that there's a lot more opportunities for kids to play travel ball uh there's you know there's so many different organizations and it, it and it kind of grows the game from that standpoint um that that's kind of a double edged sword because while that's the case like the that's really the only route to go i miss little league baseball being what at least it was in my brain it is in my brain when i was growing up like it was competitive and like every game mattered and we had standings and 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 all this kind of stuff and it was like you go you went in the championship and it mattered and um like it, it felt competitive and and fun and now like it, it doesn't seem like it has that the in-house leagues have that same um because travel ball's kind of taken away from that and travel ball's sort of like it's the only route to go if you want your kid to play competitive baseball um I don't love the tournament format so much because it's just hard. Like if you want to win a tournament, you have to play five, five games probably in a weekend. And that's hard on kids pitching. You end up having to pitch kids two, sometimes three games in a weekend. Like it's, it's crazy. I wish that there were, there was um, even just like a, you know, there, there are some leagues like in our area, there's the TSE league. And I think a little further North there's USABL. And I think there, if there was like a, you know, more of a league like that, I think kids like that. I think they like seeing standings and um, you know, we're, we're going to make the playoffs and then there's yeah. a playoffs and all yeah. of that kind of stuff. Like, I think that that's fun. Like that's, that seems like real baseball. The tournaments are fun and you get a trophy at the end of it if you win it, but it's hard and it's exhausting and parents are there from, 8 a.m. sometimes 7 a.m. It's the Eagles game. Six in the yeah, exactly. On a Sunday, you're watching the Eagles on your phone. And like, you know, you, you so it, it there's not that controlled environment of the games that I think I, you know, that I prefer. Um and another thing with while all the teams does give you, you know, kids more opportunity, it also kind of waters everything down a little bit so that, you know, every team has like a couple good players. Um, some teams have a lot of good players, you know, that draw from huge areas and 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 are really big teams. Um, but for the most part, it's it's you know it's hard to get consistent, you know, really good competition everywhere you go. Um, but yeah, I think I mean I I, w- I would I would kind of like a league, you know, a league idea. That would be the the way that I would go over the over all the tournaments all the time. Yeah, I I love that. I love the league. Because then all of a sudden the games become a little bit more special. Yeah. Like when, you, when you're playing five games in a weekend, you know, like you can see the kids. Like all right, like you know, they, they it wears them out a little bit. Whereas when you're playing one on a Friday, they're like yep. they're excited. Yep. You know, like you play three a week, you got something to look forward to, right? Yep. You know, I, yep. and I and I'm with you when it comes to a standing. Like give them something to shoot for. Give them yep. something. To say, hey, look, we're this close, and yeah. I think it, it makes you. It's like AAU basketball. I, I think that is bad for the game because it just it's too much. It's too much, yeah, yeah. No, I I agree. I remember you know playing on like a Thursday night in the fall under the lights. You know, just one game, and you go it down at, at at DV, and they had the lights, and you were, you would play your game, and it was great, and you go home, and that was it, and it wasn't like a eight hour affair. It was you played your game and you did it twice, three times a week. You were playing just about as many games. Right. Uh, but it was like, you know, it, it, it was a little at a time as opposed to just the weekends. And then that's it. Um, I don't I don't love that. All right. So I we, we got to talk about uh, your dad. So <laughs> Steve Koplov, who is uh, I, I, I love the stories. And when you regale us with the stories of dad. Who is uh, one of the great characters? Great man, beautiful, beautiful loves kids, loves the game uh, immensely. Uh, as a dad, w- uh, let's start off when uh, he signs you to a contract with the Phillies. <laughs> My dad had a lot of like um, s- psychological operations, psyops that he that he would in, uh, that he would um that he would use one of them was i remember i was a little kid we were in margate new jersey you know we'd go down there in the summer and we would be at a field and he gave me a uh, an envelope and um he told me to open it up and i opened it up and it was a 
contract that he had drawn up um, with a fake name of a Philly scout. And it said, you know, we're the Phillies. We're offering you this youth contract um, that says that if you do such and such things, and they just happen to coincide with the exact things that my dad wanted me to do, um, we will sign you on your 18th birthday. We will sign you to a, you know, to a professional contract. And, you know, I didn't know that I was nine or 10 years old. It sounded great to me. So I signed my first Phillies contract when I was nine. And I fully expected for probably like six months before I wisened up that he was full of it. But uh, he did all these kinds of things. But yeah, the, the fake Phillies contract was the best. And he still tries to do that. He does that to my son every now and then. He tells him stuff like, uh, so we have that hit tracks machine at our gym. Right. That tells you and it was, oh yeah, the you've got the uh, you're you're one mile away from the uh, New Jersey state record. I've I've got all the the annals in my in my office, and uh, and he's you know if you can get to that, they'll uh, they'll put you in the books, and you you'll have it. Yeah, there's one kid up from uh, from you know from North Jersey, and he's a little bit ahead of you right now, but you can catch him. I think there's this like fantasy kid in my son's head, I think from North Jersey, who's very good. Um, and he's constantly competing against that kid. So, uh, but like those little games, like, or, or, or things like, you know, you can kind of, I mean, I'm not going to say lie to your kids, but you can, you can, you can in inspire them in creative ways. Um, you know, and they like seeing, they like being challenged and seeing, um, seeing like progress, uh, you know, all of those kinds of things, um, you know, that are measurable kids, like and it gives them a feeling of competitiveness and a feeling of accomplishment and when they accomplish stuff it makes them like it more and want to do more so you know he's always my dad has always been all about that i have a ledger book from the time from the 1980s with all of my you know my running times how i did on fielding ground balls that day how hard i threw that day um it was all taken down and you can see like the progress from 1987 to 1990 five or whatever it was the, it was funny because didn't did at first he wanted you to play basketball he, he was yeah. going to try to get make you a basketball player he was so my dad loves basketball i love basketball but my dad loves it um and he actually crazy in the early 80s was like a partial owner of a cba team the atlantic city high rollers they were called and they played a convention hall in Atlantic City. Um, and then they got sold to Wildwood or something like that. And he didn't, but he was there. So we would go to those games. And every now and then, like one of the players would get signed by an NBA team. But um, from that time, and, you know, I, I, we had a hoop in my yard and I would train all the time. He loved it. But my dad, if you, I mean, you've met him is five, nine, 130 pounds. Like it's very unlikely that his son is going to make it real far in basketball. Um, so I think he realized that um, and kind of diverted. I always played basketball up till like high school or whatever. Did he um, put a floor in the, in the house? Well, the floor happened to be, it was hardwood and it was, you know, and it was, we had a really long house in Queen village that was straight back and there was a long hardwood floor and he would, you know, he he would pay me a dollar. This is another one. He would pay me a dollar for every lap that I dribbled up and back the house, which was probably like 40 feet up and back 50 feet. So I would dribble and dribble and dribble. And one day I was homesick from school and I dribbled a thousand laps because I'm like, I'm going to get a thousand dollars. And my dad would write me fake checks and give them to me. And I would have these checks for like thousand, a thousand dollars, six hundred dollars. I thought I was, you know, I thought never not cashable, but I thought I had money. Yeah, he kept, he, I tell you, he, he had all sorts of tricks. Welcome to Primo. How can we help you today? One old fashioned meatball and make it quick because I got practice. You got it, coach. Congratulations, coach. You've been nominated by your team to win two tickets to the big game. Wait, nominated? So I didn't win? Smile. Not it, coach. Most valuable. Not coach. it. Smile. Not coach. it. Smile. Come on, smile, smile coach. for the cows, coach. You got to be kidding me, smile, coach. coach. Did you? What was that like growing up? Like when he now? So then it's baseball. So the, yeah. knowing his nature, it's like, all right, you know, we're gonna do everything we can to help, and and it worked. I mean, I'm yeah. and I'm sure that yeah. there was a push and a pull, and you know, you know, you you as a child go, I just want to be a kid and just yeah. go play football. 
Yep. Yep. Oh, absolutely. I mean, there were, there was, and my son's the same way. Um, he's exactly the same as me. Like I, I, there were very, there were a lot of times where I was just like, I don't want to do this. I just want to sit home and play Zelda or watch, you know, wrestling on a Saturday morning or something. And a lot of times I didn't have that opportunity. It was like, you're going to the gym, you're going to practice and that's it. And there were many days where I hated it and I would fight it. And those would be terrible days. And we would argue for six hours and fight. But ultimately like my dad was very strong willed and whether we fought or not, like I did the, the work and um, I think he always knew, and this is important. Like he always knew what, what was too far for me and when to stop and when to back off. And I, I think I learned um, like a certain level of toughness and work ethic through that, um, that carried over throughout, you know, the rest of my career um, in terms of pushing through things when I didn't want to do them. But he, he had his, he really had his finger on the pulse of what I was, what was tolerable for me. And it was never like to the extent where it was not I mean, abusive or anything like that. It was just like, you're going to do it. This is it. I don't care how much you yell. Um, and I think for parents, we kind of need to know, and sometimes we do, and sometimes we don't, what our, where our kids threshold is. Like sometimes you got to, you got to pull back um, with it. And sometimes you have to be like, you can do a little bit more. So that's an important thing to learn in, in all of this, especially if your kid's serious about sports, like you right. have to, you have to find where, where that stopping point is. Um, and my dad was really good about not crossing that. No, I, that, that's a great advice too, because I think if there's a flaw today, it's we don't push hard enough. Like yeah. I do think we could, you know, there's this natural thing. And like, you know, it's so funny when you have them and when they're, how we are different than our dads in that, you're a little more, you're not as, you know, tough. Yep. You try to be. Try to be. And, yep. and you don't want to be soft and you don't want them to be that way. But you, you, you're you still, It's. Just, I just think it's societal in nature. Yep. yep. Agreed. Agreed. I think every, probably every generation says that about the one that comes after it. It's not as tough as this. Like if you hear our grandparents tell, tell stories, they probably think our parents had it easy. And I'm certain our parents think we had it easy. And now we think our kids have it easy. Um, and I think agree, it's, it's definitely societal and, 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 you know, the limits kind of keep changing on what's acceptable and what's not. Um, you know, there are certainly things that my dad did in 1986 or said to me about me that like would never fly today. And I can't do or say to my son. Um, but it was, it was fine then. And I think, I think we are at times a little hesitant um, to, to, to push our kids as much as they can be. Um, that being said, like, I'm, I'm much softer on my son than my dad was on me. And, um, and I have to kind of balance that because I don't want him, like you said, to kind of soften up as a, as a result of it, because there is, it takes toughness, not just in sports, but in life. Like it, it's, you know, yeah. you're gonna, yeah. you, you don't, you want your kid to be to have some measure of toughness in their life to deal with adversity because it's going to come, whether it's on a playing field or in a classroom or at a job later in life. Um, and sports are really good to teach you those things. Um, and so it's, it's, you know, there are lessons that they can, they can take if we are able to kind of deliver them properly as parents. Yeah. I, I had one, the other, and this was, and I think I brought it up on the podcast once, but it, it was one of those days where it was a Sunday morning. Uh, my little Moss was playing. He plays football, too. So he had, like, two baseball games, and he had uh, a football game. And so – and then we had an early tournament, right, on Sunday where we had to be at the field by 7. Right. And, you know, he did not want to get up. And my wife was like, let him sleep in. What's the – and I go, no, he has to go, like – you know, he, he like if he's, yep. if he's sick, it's one thing, but he's got to go. Like he made a commitment and he's got to yep. go. And he wound up, you know, going three for three in the game. Right. And he, he was like, I was so happy because it was validation to the parenting that right. just show up, dude. 
Like sure. life is about showing up, doing work, but just being there, like, and not calling out and not, yeah. you know, because all society now is, well, we'll just call out. Yep. Yep. Agreed. It's yeah. A, lo- a lot of it is, is showing up and, and learning to do that and, and being consistent with it and pushing yourself to, to do the right thing. Like it's, it's so much easier to stay in bed at seven o'clock on a Sunday morning. We want to do it. Like you didn't want to go to that game. I promise oh. you didn't. I certainly don't. When we, <laughs> when our team loses two games on a Saturday and we look at the bracket and we're like, Oh God, it's eight o'clock in diamond nation. That's an hour and 20 minutes away. We got to wake up at five 30. Zero people want to do that. There's nobody that wants to do it, but it's kind of part of this process. Um, and it's inspiration to the kids to not go. Oh, and two on a Saturday. Yeah. Yes. 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 What did uh, what, what is it good for kids to play multiple sports? Is it good for you know when yeah. do you, when do you yeah. say you got to choose? Uh, I mean, I think it kind of ch- ultimately chooses for them. I, um, a lot of times, like I mean, like it did for me. Like I wasn't, you know, I played basketball for a certain level, and then that was it. Like I wasn't good enough to. I could have been a the 12th man on the varsity basketball team probably, but like, you know, that's right. I was the best player on the baseball team. Like it it chose for me. And I think that happens a lot. Um, But yeah, I think, I think playing multiple sports is really good. I think it it teaches you um, different, different, you know, body movements, all these kinds of things that train, you know, you learn how to train differently for different things and, and, and adapt and your body learns how to adapt. And um, it just, it's it it helps with burnout like you know only doing baseball for 365 days is it it gets boring it's going to get boring no matter what no matter how much a kid likes baseball um alex plays basketball he's not steph curry at basketball he's just out there running around he doesn't know what he what he's doing really but he enjoys doing it and he likes jacking up shots from all over the court and whatever and it's a little less stressful for me to just go to a basketball game and watch him and be like, Oh God, what are you doing out there, man? As opposed to like losing my mind in the dugout when he takes strike three. Um, But he, uh, you know, it's, 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 they need to do things that are, that are fun in addition to things that are a little more like work and baseball or whatever sport shouldn't necessarily be work at this age, but there's a work factor to it. They have to put in the practice time. Um, And I think things that are, that are fun, whether it's football, soccer, whatever other sport they like to do, like it, it, it's, I think it's a great idea. And I think it, I, I encourage it. What what do you, you know, being a scout and you'll look at kids and, you know, you're part of the draft process and what, what do you look for? Like when you're looking at these high school kids you know, let, let's talk about that age group for a second. What, what what are you looking for? Like, what are some of the things, knowing that at some point you even mature from 18 to 22? Right. So what are you looking at, you know, for, as a scout? There's, there's, a, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of things, um, you know, and it's obviously it's different with pitchers and position players. But just from like, a, say, a position player standpoint, um, you have to look at their body. You know, that's that's really important. You there's only so much growing they're going to do. Um, and you have to, you have to see what they look like, how athletic they are, how strong they are, how strong you think they're going to get, you know, is a guy six foot one seventy, and you think he can get to 190 pounds or you think he's really, you know, he's a really narrow frame and that's about it. And that's, he's not going to get much bigger and that's going to make a big difference. Um, you know, that's one of the first things you see when you look at a player is what they look like, how big they are, how big they're going to get. Um, how 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 explosive and, and athletic they are all of those kinds of things and then you know and then you have to see them on the baseball field and what they look like um, you know from a hitting standpoint like how consistently are they barreling up the ball even in batting practice how does the ball come off their bat um, you know how do they you know, a lot of times they're not seeing really good pitching so are they hitting bad pitching the way you would expect a good hitter to hit bad pitching um, you know what they look like in the field how they move around how fast they are um, all those kinds of things with pitchers. It's this, it's a lot of the same pitching is a little easier because what they throw is kind of objective. Like he throws it that hard and his curveballs this good. And um, you know, he's six, three, one eighty five. Like that's perfect because that guy's going to be six, three, two Oh five in six years. And he's going to be throwing four miles an hour harder or whatever it is. So pitching, at the high school level is a lot easier for me to scout. Um, I, I think if you ask most scouts, the hardest 
demographic of anyone to scout is high school position players. It's just a lot of variance um, of of what what can happen. Uh, the real good ones stand out, obviously, but there's it's it's tricky. Like you look at this I'm watching Texas right now. They got this kid Evan Carter, and yes. he, yeah. nobody knew who nobody had any idea who it was. Like no. half the industry didn't even see him. He was the COVID year. He didn't play on the summer circuit the year before. So nobody saw him at the area code games and the, and the under armor games and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, the Texas, I mean, it's it, credit to them. Like their, their area guys saw him somewhere and, um, and they got enough looks at him before everything shut down and they took him in the second round. And I think a lot of the industry was like, who in God's name is Evan Carter. And the kid's fantastic. And he's in the big leagues and he's doing great in the playoffs right now. And, um, you know, they, they, they nailed it, but it's, it's that in general, that demographic's hard to get right. And you see a lot of, a lot of swings and misses, uh, with that. So, um, but yeah, when, when I'm looking, a lot of it is, is physical, like what, what they are now, what I think they'll be when they're 25 years old. Yeah. And you, you bring up, you know, judging power is so hard because, so hard. you know, like you bring up Evan Carter and wow, like, you know, yep ball flies on his bat and everybody missed him like it's, it's everybody missed him not only missed him like didn't even know who he was it's not like we we're like nah that guy yeah uh, take him in right. the seven it was like never heard of him um like that's that's really i mean that's an anomaly and that's covid doing that a lot um like some we would the industry would have caught on and by may everyone would have known who evan carter was like if he was that good but, uh, you know, te Texas got in there ahead of the curve and it all, you know, everything stopped and they were the only one of the only teams that ever had a chance to see him. Um, so. So, yeah. And that's where like modern day scouting, right, like between perfect game baseball and game changer and all these things that are out there, these tools, video, all those games that are played in Georgia, um, you know, they, there's a lot of those showcase games. Yeah. So that, like you've, like how many games you must see, I can imagine how many games you must see during the course of the year. Well, I, I, I fortunately for me, I, I don't see a lot. Not, I say fortunate because those days are very long. I don't see a lot of the amateur stuff in the summer. Like as soon as the draft is over, I go right. and throw stuff and I'm doing, free agents and trades and covering teams and, and things and now advancing and things like that. So I don't see much of the, the draft guys, but yeah, for full-time amateur scouts, like those summer days are grinding because there's four games in, in right outside of Atlanta or in long beach or San Diego or whatever it is now, or down in Fort Myers a day. And um, they're, you know, they're seeing all of these high school kids and getting their first looks at a lot of these kids that are going to be the top draft picks the following year. So like, Maybe Evan Carter was at some of those events, but not many of them. Um, whereas everyone else that's going to be drafted really high is at all of those things um, in some form or fashion. So we're getting, you know, we're getting looks at them and it's, it's, it's a lot, but for me, like, I, I mean, I see a, a million baseball games a year, but I, I'm missing some of that stuff. You know, you know it's a great lesson. We're talking about players, but I'm watching Alec Bohm field third, and it's it's a great lesson to all young baseball players because man, like you want to talk about a, a kid that made himself into being a plus fielder. Yep. Like, you know, he, listen, there, game one was a big deal. It's five three. And you know, he made two ridiculously great yep. plays to yep. save runs and, and keep yep. rallies out. Yep, he did. He's that's I mean, that's the thing. Like and we talked about him a lot in the draft room and about that. And there wasn't a, a it wasn't a strong contingent that thought he was going to stay at third base. He's you know, he's not hyper athletic. He's very big. He's got long limbs. It's like not a uh, it's not a traditional third baseman's body. There's only been a handful of guys that, that size like, you know, Roland, obviously, but Roland's in a whole different tier. And, you know, Troy Gloss was really big. But other than that, there's not six, five, third baseman. It's just, it's hard. You got to be, you got to play that game so low to the ground. So it was, you know, we definitely had those discussions and there were a few, a few people that thought he would stay at third base. And one of the things that I saw when I, when I watched him as an amateur was that gave me some confidence um, was that the, the kid puts in work. Like, I think I thought 
he wants to stay at third base and he is going to do everything he can possibly do. He doesn't want to be a first baseman. He wants to be a third baseman. Um, and I saw that in college when I saw him at Wichita. Um, and I thought like, maybe he doesn't, maybe he doesn't become capable of it, but this kid, I trust that he is going to put every ounce of his off field time into making himself as good as possible. And we have an outstanding, a lot has been said about Bobby Dickerson. We have an outstanding infield instructor and he, he was my coach in double a he's awesome. He's great with infielders and you know, God bless him. They, they work together. And there are times, cause we, we, we look back, you know, last year he made the three errors in one game, one game, one day he made three errors in one inning or something like two years ago. And it was, you know, it, it had been ugly at times, but um, he never lost faith, faith in himself being over there. Uh, the team, you know, didn't lose faith in him and it, it, it kind of flipped. And I, it's, it, that's one of my favorite things to see is when he, you know, he made that diving play down the line the other day where he backhanded and got up from his knees and threw it. And I'm like, like, that's, that's, that's awesome. It's, it's so good to see. And it's, it's just one of the things, it's a testament to, to hard work and, and belief and grinding it out and getting yourself uh, to, to where you want to be. And he's, I don't think he's going to stop improving over there. And look, he, five years from now, we might have somebody else who's a great third baseman and he goes to first base, but he has lengthened his time at third base uh, that window dramatically with all the hard work that he's put in with, with, with Bobby over there. You even see that the plate, like his plate coverage is yeah. just like, like, and that comes from work. Like that young, young kids need to see that because that plate coverage, all that stuff is, is work. Yep. It is. It is. And it's, it's, uh, I think if you watched the game yesterday, like his first at bat, he got out, um, and this isn't just him, it's 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 every hitter, but they showed him in the dugout and he's immediately on the iPad, like looking at it and and learning and saying, I've never seen this picture before. This is what he did to me. Um, and trying to figure it out and watching watching the bat over. And all of these guys are now doing that and and learning, you know, how are pitchers attacking me? And the pitchers are learning how are these hitters approaching, you know, the way I'm going at them. And it's kind of a back and forth there of of constantly growing but for 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 Bohm in particular like if you watch him his first couple of years teams just pounded him in with fastballs and as a rookie he was fine they didn't know it his second year he really struggled a lot because they're like show me you can do this and he couldn't do it for a while and then he made the next adjustment and he figured out you know how to get his barrel to the ball to that velocity a, a little bit better and and it's kind of, you know, it, it, it's helped him a lot. And he's he's still, um, I think anyone would say, like as a 6'5 third baseman, you'd love to see him turn it loose and just be like, go get it. hit, Drive it out to left field. But he's such a good hitter and he's content to line the ball in the right field a lot. Um, and and so, I mean, that's coming. He got to 20 home runs this year, and I think that's going to keep climbing um, as as he develops. But he's he's a really good hitter. Um, and it's, it's, it's fun to see, you know, guys that you draft kind of develop, um, and, and become vital parts of the team. The, the, I, the last one I just got to ask you about is watching, I saw Bryce as a young, you know, he was a phenom and, and young kids can really should go back and see it now. Cause now you can actually see his hit the way he approaches the game is a lesson to every young player. Like I, I just, I'm in awe of him as a baseball player. Yeah. Oh, okay. I mean, it's, it's look, we saw him in Washington for years and there is not a single person in Philadelphia that didn't hate his guts. Um, you know, when he played for the nationals and it's easy to take that approach when you're watching him from the other side, when you watch him on your team, that dude plays so hard all the time and it's so few players. And I, as a scout, when I, I scouted him when he was with the nationals and I heard all the stuff and it's Bryce Harper and he's a hot shot or whatever and all this shit, whatever that dude hits a ground ball. He runs hard down the line. He runs like his hair's on fire. And you're like, nobody does that. He does it all the time. He goes and balls out in the outfield for everything. When he was out there, he plays as hard as he can all the time. And there are so few players that do that. And I think the more that you watch him on your own team, you start to appreciate that. And he has played under the limelight, and it's been said, since he was 15, 16 years old. And to be the player that he is and to deal with all of that and still be as like as 
dedicated to the game and to his team and to winning as he is and playing the game hard. Like there's so few guys in, 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 in the world, in any sport that are like that. He is, so, he is like ridiculously special as a player, but as like his attitude on the field, it stands out and Phillies fans, they do appreciate it and they should appreciate it because he's a once in a generation type player from that standpoint. And it, it it's really, it's really remarkable to see and fun to watch. And, you know, I love that dude for it. I do too. I, I, and that's what I love his attitude, like greatness. There's, there's tremendously skilled players that we watch and, you know, and when we love the game, you just love watching these guys play, but it's like that attitude that like the dedication to the game, the little nuances yeah. The hard, the, all that stuff, the bust in it, man. Like it's, it's Pete Rose had that, but yeah. Bryce has it in a pure way, man. It's unbelievable. I, I just, I, I can't say enough. I knew you would, you just appreciate yeah. that. I do. Yeah. There's nothing like fake about it or anything like that. That dude wants to win. He wants to win so bad. Um, And it's, and it's, it's fun to watch and it's fun that we get to have that in our city, somebody like that, and, and admire it and appreciate it for what it is. My last thing, which, what advice do you give parents from Mike Koplov, dad, former big leaguer, major league scout, you know, coach, youth coach? What, what would you give, what advice would you give parents, general parents? Uh, <laughs> Easier said than, well, it, it's easier because to say it than do it because I'm guilty of it, but relax. Um, just relax. Like it's all of it is a process, whether your son's going to or daughter is going to get to where you want them to be or not. Um, it's so easy to spaz out on the sidelines or, or, or whatever. And I see it all the time. It's with tons of parents that are just, you know, there's plenty that, that are just there that are on the team and just having fun. But the, the ones that are serious about it, um, like it's it's hard to to just like sit back and recognize these kids are little. You know, my son is 10 years old. Your son is 10 years old. Um, it's it's they're little at this point in time and let them let them go out there and, you know, push them at the right times. But but be be a parent more than anything else. And. I'm guilty of it. Like I, it, and I have like a small group of friends that, um, you know, it, that, uh, that I'm with that we kind of, when we're together, we're like, watch me. And if I start going crazy, like pull me aside and be like, Hey, Mike, or Hey, you know, whatever, you know, cool it, cool it. Um, and you know, it's cause it's, it's hard. It's, it's frustrating sometimes like kids, they're frustrating. They're little kids. They're going to mess up. Um, and you have to, you have to remember you're a parent first before anything. And these kids are trying their best. And I will say on your behalf, the time you got thrown out of the game was not your fault. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh. I, every single person in my immediate family has now been thrown out of a, a, a magpie's <laughs> travel game. My dad, me, my wife, all of us. So Relax. Relax. Nobody will catch dad though. Nobody's going to catch Steve. He's got the record. No, no, no. He's got the most. He's yeah. He's one of a kind. There's no relaxing with Steve. No. Brother, thank you. Uh, yes. Your advice is is incredible. And uh, go Phillies, pal. Yes, go Phillies. Thanks. <laughs> hey guys, here at Yo Kid Sports for Brendan Petrilli and myself, Andy Anthony Gargano. I just want to thank you for hanging on our channel. I we love it. All right. We love doing this content. Just do us a solid and hit the subscribe button because the more people that we can reach, that we can amplify this thing, the better guests, the more content that we can produce. So do us a solid, hit the subscribe, tell your friends, your families, your coaches, get everybody subscribed because chances are here at Yo Kid Sports, we're going to be talking about your kid or your coach. It's a lot of fun. Hang with us.